Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rising. We have an amazing show for you today. We really, truly do. And Rachel Bovard back in the house once again. Great to have you, Rachel. Thanks, guys. So, Crystal, what's on deck today? All right, we got a lot of good stuff. Trump campaign is going to be here. We got some uh, tough questions for them about the how they've strayed in their direction. We've got a panel uh, to talk about some of the latest political topics. We've got Dean Baker on as well, economist, to dig into the sort of failures of the coronavirus economic response. But we wanted to start with some major uh, election results from last night. Let's start with the biggest headline of them all, which is progressive challenger Cory Bush, Justice Democrat, has knocked off Lacey Clay Jr., member of the CBC. He and his father combined have represented this district in Missouri, which includes St. Louis, includes Ferguson, for more than 50 years. So this is a huge, earth-shattering development. Of course, we saw AOC take out Joe Crowley. We saw Jamal Bowman take out uh, Elliot Engel. And now we have Cori Bush taking out Lacey Clay. Let's take a little, uh, listen to a little bit of what she had to say last night in her victory speech. They counted us out. They called me, you know, I'm just the protester. Uh -huh. I'm just the activist Come on. with no name, no title, and no real money. Come on. That's all they said that I was. Yes. But St. Louis showed up today. So, so Rachel, this is a very blue district. Um, so she will be the member of Congress. She'll be the first black woman to ever represent Missouri in Congress, which is mind blowing. And there's so many dynamics here that I am excited to talk about. But this is a this is a working class woman. She's a registered nurse. She came to prominence in the Ferguson, Missouri protest. She is that activist as she speaks to there. And also, this is a little bit of a different model in terms of how she was able to win and the dynamics of the race. With AOC and Joe Crowley, you have a young woman of color and a kind of old, out of touch white guy. With Jamal Bowman and Elliot Engel, very similar dynamic. Here, you have an African-American woman, young woman, taking out an African-American man who is a CBC uh, member in, you know, the middle of the country, so also not New York City. It has got to send shockwaves to, all, through all kinds of Democratic incumbents throughout the country. Yeah, so this is kind of what I love about our modern politics, right? I'm probably going to disagree with everything that Cori Bush does in the House. Yeah. But what I love about, you know, and what keeps me in this otherwise soul-destroying game <laughs> is the fact that, like, normal people still have a voice. Yeah. Right? And that is what we should have in a representative self-government is this, you know— you don't, you have these entrenched members of Congress who start to take their representative duties for granted. You know, and I think that was one of the critiques that Corey made. She said, look, Clay doesn't show up. He doesn't show up for votes. You know, he's been sort of granted this seat in a family legacy. You know, and you start to get entrenched views and you don't feel like you have to hustle to really represent those people on the ground. And I think when people get called out on that, it is nothing but good. Yeah. You know, because it pushes oxygen into the room. And I think this anti-establishment uh, zeitgeist that exists on the left and the right, you love to see it. You do love to see it. This is the seventh incumbent um, who has lost in their primary of both Democrats and Republicans. So there is definitely some kind of mood out there in the country. Another thing that is different about her victory versus AOC's and Jamal Bowman's is their opponents kind of took the whole thing for granted. They were kind of lazy. They don't didn't really, yeah. you know, they didn't really take it seriously. Lacey Clay took this very seriously. He raised money. He was up on the air. He had some of the nastiest, the mailers that I saw in that race were d nasty and vicious and going after Cori Bush for, you know, back taxes, painting her as like a deadbeat, essentially very classist attacks. Also, you know, trying to make, the, he, he used Linda Sarsour to paint her as somehow anti-American. I mean, it was a really vicious race and very hard fought. So to see Corey prevail in this way is, I think, incredibly encouraging exactly for the reasons that you're saying. And the other dynamic here, in, and Corey made this point when we had her here on Rising um, recently, is essentially this idea that the fact that Lacey Clay Jr., um, what you know, representation was not enough, that it wasn't just, okay, you can be a member of the CBC and that's good enough at the Congressional Black Caucus. It's like, no, we actually are going to look at your record. Mm -hmm. We're going to yeah. look at what you have done in concrete terms for this community. And if you're not showing up, doesn't matter that we may sh share the same identity. We are going to expect and demand more. Let's take a look, listen to uh, Corey in her own words when she was here on Rising. 
our congressmen touts that experience and uh, and relationships are the reason why he should stay in this seat. Well, I'll say this. In 2014, June of 2014, two months before Michael Brown was murdered, he when he could have voted to demilitarize the police, he didn't. He supported the, the police militarization. And then what happened? We had a militarized force on the ground. I myself was abused by the police at that time. So many others. I saw people hung upside down, hog tied, hanging off of batons. You know, innocent people were brutalized and have since been brutalized because of the decision that he made. Well, if that's expertise, that's not the kind that we need. Also, um, you know, when we talk about how much this person votes, does he show up to, to vote as much as, you know, just on average, as much as other um, uh, Congress people? No, he does not. He, he is not somebody who is from the ground. He's not on the ground. Now, that may have been OK for years past, but now it's a new day. We deserve we deserve more and we deserve better. I don't know that there is anyone in Congress currently who is quite like Cori Bush. So it's going to be exciting to see what she does there. One other thing I'll throw in the mix here, though, she was backed by Bernie Sanders. AOC stayed out, even though they're, they're personal friends. They were both in this Knock Down the House documentary last time because Cori, uh, this is her second time, challenging Lacey Clay. And AOC and Clay serve on some of the same, at least one of the same committees. He backed the Green New Deal, and so she stayed hands off in this race, which is kind of a sign of how hard it is to continue to be that outsider anti-establishment candidate once you actually get into this house. Things become transactional. They do. And I think AOC is going to be interesting to watch in that regard. Yes. Because she does, I think, want some influence and some power. But when you're in the halls of, of the Capitol, that comes with a price. Yeah. And so you saw it in this race. You know, you want support from an institutional Democrat, well, on this issue, then it means you stay out of this race here. And so these are the deals that you make. Apparently. Um, a couple other results we wanted to bring to you here. Another one from Missouri. They voted. Voter, there was a ballot initiative on expanding Medicaid. Um, they voted in favor of it. So that passed. This is the, the latest red state to vote in favor of the Medicaid expansion. I believe that that has been approved by voters every time it has uh, faced an up or down vote. So that is uh, an interesting development there as well. Rashida Tlaib was on ballot yesterday, she faced a very serious primary opponent, uh, a, an opponent who she had actually faced twice before in two different races. And in one, uh, her opponent narrowly won. In the other one, Rashida narrowly won. That's why she is a member of Congress. Currently, she is leading in this race. And Rachel, part of the dynamic here is obviously, you know, the, the fate of Rashida Tlaib, member of the squad, is interesting. But also the fact we don't have a result, and that's kind of the new normal. This is the new normal. And something people really need to prepare themselves for as we look forward to November and how that is all going to unfold. Yeah, I think uh, there's been early elections, you know, a month or two ago in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, many of which were done by mail-in ballots that are delayed for that reason, yeah. right? It's just a resourcing question. It's, you know, a logistics question. It's something, you know, mail-in ballots have existed forever, but when you scale it statewide and when you scale it nationwide, you know, God forbid we're going to have some issues, probably. I, th I mean, I think you look at New York. Yeah, we are what they're weeks, dealing with in New York. Yeah. Six weeks out from their election, I covered this a little bit in my radar today, but um, they just served a couple of those races yesterday, and there's still tremendous questions. Um, something like 20% of the mail-in ballots were tossed out because of technicalities. So this has this has not gone smoothly in a lot of places. So um, that's an important dynamic to keep an eye on as well. But the one I want to want to really get your take on. We talked here yesterday about the Kansas Senate primary. Chris Kobach who's a sort of, I don't know, right wing, like anti-immigration, very aggressive when he was, especially when he was secretary of state of Kansas on, you know, voter ID and those sorts of things, voter suppression, I would call it. So he's been a real firebrand on the right. Trump endorsed him in his governor's race last time. He narrowly wins the primary and then he loses the election because even in the state of Kansas, he is so controversial that he lost in that state, even as the Republican nominee. This time around, Mitch McConnell came in really hard Swinging. against Kobach and essentially said, look, the GOP majority is at stake here. Voters apparently heard that call and his opponent, Roger Marshall, won, it looks like, pretty handily in the Republican primary yesterday. Yeah, you know, I, so we have another dead plant in the Senate. Like, I, 
<laughs> I'm trying to get excited about it. I can't really get excited about it. You know, to the McConnell critique, you know, to your point, McConnell made this race about the future of the Republicans in the Senate. If we're going to keep our majority, we have to have Roger Marshall. The veracity of that claim, I think, is still to be tested because there's a number of races across the country that are still going to be decided. But I think it goes to the thesis that I put forward yesterday, which is that, you know, I don't think you can put the fate of the Republican majority in the Senate into one race or another because yeah. the Senate Republicans themselves have not made the theory of the case for why they should be reelected and given the majority again. And I think you're seeing this right now in the Senate negotiations. Yeah. Why, are, why do Republicans have a majority in the Senate? They're not even participating in these negotiations. Yeah. Mitch McConnell has benched himself. Yeah. Right. And so I think, you know, Republicans as a whole are saying, what are we what did we get? What did we get from a Republican Senate majority? And that case has not been made. And I'm sorry, the fear mongering that goes into losing the majority, the, you loses its sting when you don't have anything to point to to say, we'll give you more of X. Oh, they got that. The corporate tax deal. Got right. Through, yes. So. Oh, yeah. corporate tax. <laughs> Corporate tax cuts and more war, right? Like, <laughs> Congratulations, great. guys. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. um, Vote for us. Well, I'm interested in your take here vis-a-vis -vis Trump because he stayed out of this race this time. Um, and, you know, Kobach is clearly sort of more of a Trumpist type of candidate. Uh, immediately after Roger Marshall wins, Trump jumps in with a tweet congratulating him. Great race. Very tough. Um, he loves Kansas. One represented incredibly well. And he says this is not the opponent the Democrats wanted, which is true, actually. This seat probably not in play anymore. Um, not that Kansas ever should have been in play. But... Trump stays out of this race, and so the sort of standard issue McConnell Chamber of Commerce candidate wins. In Alabama, he actually endorses against Jeff Sessions yeah. because of the personal beef over his handling of the Russiagate investigation and backs Tommy Tuberville, who is another sort of standard issue Chamber of Commerce McConnell-type Republican. So he doesn't seem to have any interest outside of his own sort of weird personal beefs in moving his own legacy forward or protecting that uh, direction of the Republican Party here. Yeah, I think uh, I think Trump is listening too much to the McConnell wing of the party. I think it's like, you know, McConnell says, Mr. President, you know, press the endorse button here. And Trump's like, OK. Right. Right. And, and I think it's a dis I think it just does a disservice to what Trump is trying to do, to be honest, because, again, it is the backlash, you know, a little bit of or the revenge of this neoliberalism to some extent. Like, McConnell does not care about the Trump agenda. McConnell cares about power. Yeah. And, and, for, and that power for McConnell is having, collecting senators who will do whatever it is that he wants, support the big corporatist agenda, not challenge him on any other wedge issue. And, you know, you're seeing this again in Tennessee. This is going to be another big uh, opportunity, I think, to, for this clash to take place. Trump, I think, has actually endorsed or will, no, he has not yet endorsed, but there's rumor he will, Bill Haggerty, who's his former ambassador to Japan, but the primary there is between Haggerty and a guy named Manny Sethi, who's a more insurgent candidate, Indian immigrant, you know, more forceful on the Trump agenda. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce types hate him. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think we're going to see this dynamic play out again. But you And know, you expect Trump, though, to endorse his former ambassador. <laughs> yeah, I, that's Even the Even though he's the McConnell Chamber of Commerce dude. Yeah, and I think that's the And I think it's, again, like Trump deferring a little bit of this. He's outsourcing, I think, some of these political questions. And I don't think it's good for the party. I don't think it's good for Trump. Look, I don't like any of these people. Let's just be clear. <laughs> Fair. But I do think it, I mean, I think it reveals that a lot of the rhetoric that he adopted, like he doesn't really care. You know, he doesn't care that it actually occurs. If he did, then he would have pushed harder for it during his time in office here. And he would back candidates who were consistent with the views that he articulated when he was running for office. Instead, it seems to be more about like, you know, what he's told to do or what his personal relationships say than any actual affirmative vision for the country, which I think fits into precisely why he's losing so badly right now. Yeah, I think it's a it's a fair critique. And I think it's been a big disappointment to people like me who really wanted the Republicans to sort of move in this new direction, right? And really push for, to, to erode some of these corporatist elements that have dominated the party for so long. And I think it's been a disappointment. Yeah, really, really fascinating results. And I'm gonna tell you what's on my radar. That's next.